Just give our listeners a little bit of an insight into what we actually mean by chronic fatigue syndrome. When energy delivery mechanisms are abnormal, Dale Bredesen can reverse what we call dementia in older people by doing a ketogenic diet. If you were to go to a GP and you presented with this plethora of symptoms, what's your doctor going to say and do? So much medicine these days is symptom suppression medication, which is short-term gain, long-term pain. They are blocking enzyme systems in the body. They're anti-inflammatory. Now, I do believe you are one of the most prosecuted medical doctors in your history by the General Medical Council. And his comment was, the problem with the Michael case is that all the patients are better and none of them will give witness statements against her. Is there something going wrong with the gut? Sometimes this is where all the answers just are presented to you. They never diagnose adrenal fatigue, but that is the most common issue that we are grappling with in patients with fatigue syndromes. An autoimmune condition is like civil war in our bodies. It's the immune system fighting ourselves, and that is invariably damaging and shortens lifespan. Yeah. So gluten is just not for human consumption, is my personal view. Welcome to the CNM Specialist Podcast with me, Bobby Qureshi. I'm a naturopath, osteopath, and the Director of Education for the College of Naturopathic Medicine. In this podcast series, we will be addressing and discussing some of health's biggest topics. We'll be talking with some of the industry's leading experts in the world of natural health and looking at various natural therapies and their effectiveness. There is no subject that we won't cover in this podcast series, so sit back, relax, and may you never view health and medicine the same again. Today, I'm delighted to welcome highly respected naturopathic physician, Dr. Sarah Myhill, onto the show. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Myhill has dedicated her life to medicine since initially qualifying as a doctor in 1981. She has worked for both the NHS and private practice as a GP and has since trained in naturopathic medicine. Dr. Myhill is the well-respected author of six books and an international lecturer. She's renowned for being a leading expert in the field of chronic fatigue syndrome slash ME, and this will be the focus of today's discussion. So, Dr. Myhill, a huge welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. The pleasure is all mine, Bobby. You always ask the right questions, so I think we shall enjoy ourselves, if nothing else. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, are you coping okay with the, the heat at the moment? Oh, it's wonderful. We get so <laughs> few days like this, I'm not going to moan about it. <laughs> Good. Fantastic. Well, um, let's get stuck straight into things. Um, and what I'd just love you to do to start with is just give our listeners a little bit of an insight into what we actually mean by chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. Okay. The key point to remember about chronic fatigue syndrome and ME is they are not diagnoses, they are clinical pictures. So a diagnosis implies a particular scheme of management but a clinical picture just means I recognize what's going on there so for example you might have I might have a patient come to me with dementia but I want to know is that dementia due to a drug side effect is it due to a prior disorder like Alzheimer's disease is it due to Jakob Creutzfeldt disease is it due to poor blood supply to the brain so we have to always think mechanisms and chronic fatigue uh, Chronic fatigue syndrome is the clinical picture that uh, we see when energy delivery mechanisms are abnormal or down, going slow. ME is the clinical picture we see when we have a chronic fatigue syndrome, poor energy delivery mechanisms, and inflammation. And inflammation is the clinical picture we see when the immune system is busy. And the immune system may be busy for reasons of chronic infection, or indeed acute infection. It may be busy for reasons of allergy or autoimmunity. So in any patient who comes to see me, I always start off with looking at energy delivery mechanisms. Uh, and then we go on to think about uh, the, infl the inflammatory hole in the energy bucket, as I call it. Because when the immune system is busy, it causes very nasty symptoms, symptoms of inflammation. But the immune system is very demanding of energy. So that zaps our energy. So you know, any young person who gets flu will know exactly how a patient with ME feels. They haven't got any energy. They're lying in bed feeling terrible. And the clinical picture there is acute ME. Excellent. Thank you for your explanation. That makes perfect sense. I like how you describe as well with the fact that when you're ill, you're using a lot of energy. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense to a lot of people that have chronic fatigue syndrome or ME as well. 
In terms of the energy delivery mechanisms, when you're sort of explaining this to your patients, how do you put this across into words that they understand? Well, I'm a very simple person and I like to use simple language. And the analogy that I use that I get and my patients get is the car analogy. Mm -hmm. We have to think of four important players with respect to energy delivery mechanisms. And the first thing is the fuel in the tank. You know, I've got an ancient old banger out there that trots along on diesel, but if I put petrol in it, it's just not going to go smoothly. And our fuel in the tank is our diet and gut function. So we could spend the whole day talking about diet and gut function uh, because there's so much to say about it, but we've got to get that right first. Sure. Then we have to look at the mitochondrial engine, and it's the engine which takes fuel and oxygen and converts that into energy. But that engine has to be controlled, and the control mechanisms are the thyroid accelerator pedal, which determines how fast our engines go, how fast our mitochondria go, and the adrenal gearbox, which allows our engine to gear up in response to stress. And it's all those four things, you know, playing together at the same time, working well, that gives us good energy delivery mechanisms. That's a really beautiful analogy, Sarah. And I think for patients as well, it's something that's quite tangible to think of a car, to think of the parts of the car. It, it kind of makes sense. Um, I know I've used it a few times, actually, since learning about your kind of protocol for chronic fatigue syndrome and patients react to it. They do understand that and it, it, it makes sense. So from, from your perspective and from your experience working in this field and applying that car analogy, is there one particular part of the, the car that we find tends to go wrong or is it sort of a, a, you know, a mixture of different factors? How does that generally work from your experience? The most common thing to go wrong is the diet. Uh, because if you have a diet which is too high in sugars and carbohydrates, then you will overwhelm the ability of the gut to deal with it. Now, the upper gut should be a sterile, carnivorous gut for the business of digesting and absorbing uh, fats and proteins and micronutrients. Now, if we overwhelm the ability uh, of that upper gut to be sterile, because it should, there should be no microbes there, then we end up with a fermenting upper gut, by which I mean the stomach, the duodenum, the jejunum and the small intestine. The upper fermenting gut is, is very bad news because when you start to take micronutrients and we need micronutrients to correct our mitochondrial engine and our thyroid accelerator pedal and our adrenal gearbox, if the upper gut is full of bacteria and maybe yeast, then you will be feeding those microbes. Uh, one of the interesting things about mitochondria, i.e. the engines of, of our car, is that from an evolutionary perspective, they derive from bacteria. Mm. So if you have got some supplements to feed our mitochondria, the bacteria are going to love them too. So not only uh, do you waste all that precious money on supplements which aren't getting where they're needed, you're feeding those bacteria and they end up fermenting harder as a result. Yeah. So there is a certain order to this and it absolutely starts off with the paleoketogenic diet which has to be very low in carbohydrates so that we fuel our body with fat and we fuel our body with fiber, which is fermented in the lower bowel, the colon, the last bit of our gut. That is a vegetarian fermenting gut, which ferments fiber to produce at the energy molecules, short chain fatty acids and at which are ketone bodies. So the single most important thing to do is to put the right fuel in our tank, and that is ketones. And we get ketones from eating fat, and we get ketones from eating fiber. Once we have done that, then we stop feeding those abnormal fermenters in the upper gut, and all of a sudden, we start to absorb. Mm -hmm. And I see lots of patients who come and see me, and they've spent a lot of money on a lot of supplements, and they're no better because they haven't sorted the diet out. Yeah. So, yes, the diet is the big thing, the diet is the most difficult thing, and the diet is the thing yeah. we all have to start off with. Sure, that makes sense. And so from the perspective of, of you know, somebody coming in with chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, you're looking really at those refined carbohydrates, you're looking at the, the real problematic sugars, and instead you're ideally trying to get more fiber into their diet, but of course, as you said, focusing on the high fat foods, hence the ketogenic mm -hmm. 
So for so, some of our listeners who maybe don't know much about what a paleo ketogenic diet, what that sort of entails, um, give me a, a quick summary of, of what that would involve in terms of those carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and how that all works together. Well, the, the, the single most helpful tip for my patients is to recognize that sugars and carbohydrates are addictive. Mm. And what addiction means is in the short term, they give us a little bit of energy, we feel a little bit better, but you, having had an upper, you then have a downer with all the problems that go with that. And once people recognize that uh, sugars and carbohydrates are so addictive, it makes, them, it makes it easier for them to rationalize what they should be eating. And what we should be eating is uh, for breakfast, a good old fashioned fried breakfast with bacon, eggs, um, a gluten free sausage, um, tomatoes, a, a black pudding, that sort of thing as a fry up. Uh, some people absolutely can't fancy that, but, uh, but that's the <laughs> ideal. And then lunchtime would be maybe salad with lots of salad dressing or mayonnaise because that's high in oils and fats, which you'd have with avocados or um, tomatoes, cucumber for the, for the crunch factor. Mm. Uh, and then evening meal would be meat and vegetables again with berries and maybe coconut uh, coconut cream. Uh, I love this particular coconut cream I love to use, which is only 2% carbohydrate. It has the same texture as, as cream, so it really is very delicious. Amazing. So, so, so the, 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 the diet, the paleo-ketogenic diet, can be very attractive and very delicious. But when you talk about taste with people, they confuse addiction with flavor. And uh, uh, your carbohydrate addict, for example, will not be satisfied with the meal until they've had a sugar hit, which we call pudding. <laughs> uh, and if, if that is the case for you, then you are still a carbohydrate addict. Uh, you know, there's, the paleo ketogenic diet is not a low calorie diet. In fact, it's high in calorie, it's rich in fat, it's rich in fiber, and it's a very varied diet. Mm. And once you get onto it, uh, most people tell me, yep, you know, even there are set normal people who don't have chronic fatigue syndrome, even elite athletes. Elite athletes, especially the endurance runners, they can improve their performance when they are running on ketones. Mm. And the example that I always cite is that of Mike Morton, keto adapted athlete. He holds the world record for the furthest distance run in 24 hours. 172 kilometers wow. he did not have to eat during the course of uh, of that run now if you by contrast if you look at the athletes who are running on uh carbohydrates <coughs> they have to be topped up with sugar <coughs> excuse me they have to be topped up with sugar with jelly babies or jelly beans or glucose drinks mm. um during their um run or they literally they run out of fuel i think you highlighted a key point there sarah which is getting over the addiction right you have to to make the change and to shift your dietary preferences you've got to get over that initial bit which is difficult you know I've been through that I'm sure you've probably been through that to get to where you are and I find with my patients that you just sort of need to get them over that initial few weeks couple of months maybe and then they suddenly start to feel oh actually I'm not craving that cake after dinner or I'm not craving that sugary snack to get me through the day because obviously your diet's keeping you going it's keeping you fueled with energy so it makes perfect sense. I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, your protocol. So we'll come back to this a little bit later and how you kind of evolve on that. Um, I, I'm quite interested to know, um, really for, from your perspective, a little bit more about the symptoms and the, and the sort of the diagnostics really um, around chronic fatigue syndrome. Because of course, fatigue in the name tells us the, the main symptom, but what other symptoms do you typically see with these sorts of presentations? Well, uh, let's start off with fatigue because um, uh, the, the difference between normal fatigue and pathological fatigue is the delay factor. Mm. So at the end of the day, I will be tired. Yes, I will have a good night's sleep and I'll wake up tomorrow morning and I shall be as right as rain. But my patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, they know how much energy they can spend in a day. And if they spend more energy than that, then they will pay for it the following day. Mm. And we're on the same spectrum as athletes. In athletes, this is called overtraining. If athletes overtrain, they pay for it the next day. So the essence of training is to exercise to your optimum, wake up the next morning feeling fine and ready to go again. But of course, after they've competed, after they've just broken world records, then they will get pathological fatigue because they achieved that and damage their bodies at the same time. They run their energy delivery mechanisms right into the ground. And that is the danger of graded exercise therapy. Now, 
If you give a patient who has chronic fatigue syndrome graded exercise therapy, I guarantee you will make them worse. If you don't make them worse, then they don't have chronic fatigue syndrome. They have something else. It is a condition defined by exercise intolerance. Mm. Now, with, with respect to energy delivery mechanisms, okay, it's not just energy delivery to the body. Um, it's also energy delivery to the brain. Yeah. And all the, although the brain weighs just 2% of body weight, it consumes 20% of all the energy that's generated in the body. So if energy delivery mechanisms to the brain go slow, then the brain will malfunction. Can't think clearly, mm. cannot multitask, cannot problem solve, poor short-term memory. Actually, we are talking about an early dementia. Mm. And clinically, that is what it is. It is an early dementia. And interestingly, uh, consultant neurologist Dale Bredesen can reverse what we call dementia in older people by dint of doing a ketogenic diet. It's there in the literature. It's proven. So it just illustrates the point that ketones are essential. And, and a third department that I always ask about is energy delivery to the heart. What are the yeah. symptoms of that? Now, if you cannot supply energy to the heart efficiently, then it won't beat powerfully as a pump. So we get these rather weak and flabby beats. It doesn't have the energy to beat strongly. Initially, the, the heart tries to compensate for that by beating faster. So then this can be measured. So the, severe, the more severely chronically fatigued patients will have low blood pressure because the heart doesn't beat powerfully as a pump. And then the heart starts to compensate by being faster. So at rest, one's resting heart rate should be about 70 to 75 beats per minute. If it's 80 to 90 and the blood pressure is starting to fall, then that's a, an early symptom of poor energy delivery mechanisms to the heart. Now, in the very severe patients, uh, the problems will arise when they try to stand up. Because the business of standing up means the heart has to beat 20% harder. But if you haven't got the energy to do that, then when these sick patients stand up, initially there's an attempt to maintain cardiac output by the heart beating much faster but of course that demands energy as well that cannot be sustained the patients fall over they have to go horizontal and that clinical picture is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome it's exactly the same clinical picture as somebody with heart failure and i learned this from a consultant cardiologist in italy called gabriella segura uh, completely conventional doctor who started life off with you know the drugs the uh, surgery the pacemakers and now simply practices nutritional medicine because she cures her patients with these interventions and uh, uh, she again is insistent on uh, the ketogenic diet ketones are the desirable fuel for the for heart muscle so those are the three groups of symptoms that I'm looking for okay. poor energy delivery to the body to the brain and to the heart. Mm. And, uh, and that gives us a very good clue that that patient has got poor energy delivery mechanisms and therefore the clinical picture yeah. of chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So we're looking at really a diverse array of symptoms in different parts of the body. I think actually when I first qualified um, initially as an osteopath, I remember being taught about chronic fatigue syndrome, but it was very, very, very limited. And I was quite blown away with how much brain fog actually patients were getting. That was one of the big symptoms that surprised me in terms of that clinical presentation. Um, and I love the way you talk about fatigue in terms of, you know, using up that currency almost. You've got so much currency to use and you can use it up quickly. Uh, one of my first patients when I trained um, at, at CNM had come in saying, look, Bobby, I, I literally don't have the energy to clean my house. That's all I want to do. I just want to clean my house and I can't do it. I have to get a cleaner. And I remember two months down the line, we, we had, a, I think it was our second follow-up and she came in literally in, in tears saying, I've cleaned my house every day this week. And, you know, obviously to your average person, that doesn't mean much, but to somebody that that's all they've wanted to do and suddenly they've got more currency in their bank account now, in their energy bank account, it's an amazing thing. So, and this is applying your protocol. So thanks to you, Sarah. Um, so if you were to go to a doctor, if you were to go to a GP and you presented with this plethora of symptoms, uh, what's your doctor going to, to say and do? Well, the problem is doctors don't 
think anymore. They don't think in a joined up way. And the way we should diagnose is we start with symptoms and we get to mechanisms and that has obvious implications for management. But doctors don't do that. So much medicine these days is symptom suppressing me medication, which is short term gain, long term pain. So, for example, you know, what would be the treatment of migraine? migraine drugs to control the pain what's the treatment for blood pressure antihypertensives you know what's the treatment of depression antidepressants and so on they are not thinking causation and they certainly don't think causation with chronic fatigue syndrome in fact when i started in practice in the early 1980s the t-a-t-t -T, the tired all the time patient yeah. was estimated to occupy 40 percent of all consultations so doctors have never got to grips with it. What the patient does is the patient uses addictions to deal with that fatigue in the short term. And the obvious one that most people rely on is coffee, mm. coffee and sugar. And if people are going through the day and they're keeping going on little snacks, which might be crisps, Mars bars, sugar sweets, cups of coffee, then they are starting to become fatigue they're yeah. starting to to lose control uh, and that's often the beginning of it um, and then we use addictions to deal with painful symptoms because yeah. uh, these symptoms are very painful now the key point to remember about uh, energy is that yes we have a certain bucket of energy to spend in a day and you alluded to that now if we spend more energy than we have available to us then we will die so the body cannot permit that state of affairs to take place. Mm. And so the body has to give us symptoms to stop us from spending energy. Yeah. And if those symptoms aren't very painful, then we'll, we'll just fight it. We'll, we'll just push on and push on and push on yeah. until we die. And of course, the first person who did that was the marathon runner um, who ran 27 plus miles to deliver good news to the King of Greece and dropped dead on arrival <laughs> because he had pushed his body to his absolute limit, had no energy left, and he dropped dead. So, uh, so I say, with the reason we have these unpleasant symptoms is uh, is to stop us from dying. Yeah. I have to say, you know, um, uh, cleaning my house every day would come very low down on my personal <laughs> list of it priorities. It would me too. <laughs> very low. <laughs> so, if you, you know, if you if you think of an average patient going to see their doctor, you know, there'll be many listeners to this podcast who will have gone through this process. What's the realistic kind of information they're given, advice they're given? Is there any treatment, for example, from, from conventional medicine? What the conventional medical doctors do is they exclude major pathology by maybe doing some blood tests. But then the patient usually gets thrown into the psychiatric dustbin. They usually get told, you're depressed, you're, hi you're a hypochondriac, pull yourself together, mm. go and do some great exercise and you'll feel much better. And those patients know mm. that that is bad advice. They know they're not uh, depressed. They might be frustrated. They might be hacked off because they know they're not living up to their full potential. Uh, but they know that they're not depressed and, uh, you, and very often they just go away and never come back. So it is an appallingly treated condition because the doctors are not asking the question why. They're not asking about the mechanisms of energy delivery. I mean, the, the, the shameful thing is they do know about them. Yeah. When I was at medical school, second MB, uh, biochemistry, we learned about mitochondria there, mitochondria, mm. the engines of our car. Yeah. And it was one of those subjects that you mugged up the night before on chocolate biscuits and lots of coffee. You regurgitated onto the exam paper the next day hoped you'd done enough to pass and you forgot it all and we forgot it all because we didn't understand that it had any clinical application whatsoever now we know that mitochondria are implicated in almost any pathology you care to mention from dementia cancer heart disease diabetes uh, liver failure any organ failure uh, will be failing because it doesn't have the energy it needs to function efficiently. Yeah. So mitochondria are essentially important. And anybody listening to this podcast, it doesn't matter if you have chronic fatigue syndrome or you have some other pathology or you simply want to improve your athletic performance. If you put in place all these interventions and give them a chance to work, because as soon as you start to heal the body, you get what I call DDD reactions, diet, die off and detox reactions. If you can put these interventions in place, then A, uh, you will improve your current state of affairs. B, you will hugely protect yourself from future pathology. 
and see you will improve your longevity. Now, mm. I'm old, I'm having fun, but I want to go on having fun a bit longer. So I am disciplined about what I eat. I am disciplined about yeah. what I do because I feel well and I want to go on for a few more years yet. So you've mentioned these mitochondria, Sarah, um, and just for our listeners, just give us a little simple explanation as to what these mitochondria are. Mitochondria work just like car engines. They take fuel from the bloodstream, they take oxygen from the bloodstream, and they burn it. And when you burn fuel, you create energy. Now, the energy molecule in the body is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. But think of it as money. Think of it as currency. And with that ATP money, you can buy any job in the body. You can contract a muscle, you can conduct a nerve, you can synthesize proteins, and so on. Without ATP, uh, we could not survive. So that mitochondria are essential for all life. Make, it makes perfect sense. Obviously, if we're coming back to a condition where there is poor energy production and poor distribution, basically, of energy around the body, obviously going back to the engine and thinking about how that energy is created with these little factories, that's, that's a, a good way of thinking about it. So, Sarah, from, from your background, obviously, you were conventionally trained. You went through the conventional medical training, um, yet you've ended up in a place where you're now very well respected for your knowledge and expertise as a practitioner in the field of chronic fatigue syndrome. So how, how did that happen and, and where did you learn and how did you learn about these, <laughs> these tools that you could use for these patients? The answer is through bitter experience. Now, when I qualified in 1981, of course, I was young, um, came out of my class, I thought I knew it all. And I have to say those early days in general practice were very humbling because patients come in with their migraine and no, they don't want the drugs. They come in with their irritable bowel syndrome and no, they don't want the drugs. They want to know the question, why? Why have I got this problem? Yeah. And I realized that my medical training had given me very little to equip me um, to answer those questions. And uh, my, my usual ploy in the early days was, well, let's do a blood test and, uh, and then I'll see you next week. And of course I do the blood test and thumb through my books, you know, phone a friend. And I still was none the wiser. My lovely patients, so often they came up with the answer. Do you think it could be something to do with diet? Oh, mm. goodness, I said, you know, I've got no idea. I really don't know. And again, what I was so relieved to find out is that um, my patients valued my um, ability to say, I don't know, but I do care over and above my ability to know or not know things. Sure. <laughs> so I was very lucky. They were very forgiving. And we started experimenting with diets. And we got some extraordinary results early on. In fact, the, the first thing I really learned about was allergy. And actually, this applied to me personally, because my daughter was born uh, soon after I started in medicine. And she had the most terrible colic. And I couldn't I just didn't know, know what to do about it. And I can remember my husband then saying, you know, you're the effing doctor, you sort it out. And something uh, persuaded me to stop all the dairy products that I was consuming. And it really was like a miracle. She was fully breastfed, but as we know, all foods get into the breast milk and she was reacting allergically to milk protein. And her colic stopped almost overnight and suddenly she became a quiet, easy, loving little baby. And you know, on one occasion when uh, I'd had some dairy products by uh, mistake, she was up all night screaming all over again. Now that single clinical fact has helped so many patients, so many mums. And it's not just the colicky baby, it's the child with recurrent ear infections, with recurrent tonsillitis, with eczema, with asthma, yeah. and then uh, the adult with migraine and arthritis and so on. So I started off with allergy simply by asking the question why. And my my evolution towards naturopathic medicine has been simply through asking the question why. And I've sat in with other doctors, I've gone to as many conferences as I can, I've read as widely as I can, always with that question why at the forefront of my mind, and always with patients in the forefront of mind with whom I'm, I'm not succeeding, I'm not failing. And I gradually put the jigsaw puzzle together and I know I don't know all the pieces, but I do know that I'm asking the right questions, uh, but I don't know all the answers to them. Yeah. Uh, and that's how, essentially. That's beautiful. I think that's, it's lovely how you've gone through that with your family and you've you know, put this into practice and, and it's evolved naturally from there. Um, that, that's great. 
And so uh, one thing I did actually want to ask you about was something that, uh, a statistic that you probably, <laughs> I'm not sure how happy you are about this, but uh, I do believe you are one of the most uh, prosecuted uh, medical doctors in your history uh, by the General Medical Council, uh, which I, I did hear this is only by your peers and never have you received a complaint by a patient, which I do think does say a lot, but I'm just interested by this. Tell me, Sarah, a little bit more if that's, that's the case and why. Well, the first 20 years of medical practice was within the NHS as a general practitioner. No complaints, no problems whatsoever. But when I went into independent practice, it was my view that any knowledge that I knew should be available for anybody to access. And so I built a website. Uh, well, I didn't, uh, but I developed a website and put all my information on there. And then, of course, patients were coming to see me and I, was, I would invariably write to their doctors to tell them what was going on. And those GPs, those consultants, sometimes those health authorities uh, knew that I wasn't practicing conventional medicine. They didn't like some of the interventions that I was recommending, and so they reported me to the General Medical Council. So as you point out, um, I'm the most prosecuted doctor in the history of. The current score is My Hill 38, General Medical Council nil. <laughs> but one, one very revealing comment was I routinely do Freedom of Information Act search of the GMC. And there was a very telling comment from a QC who was advising the General Medical Council. And his comment was, the problem with the Myhill cases is that all the patients are better and none of them will give witness statements against mm. her. <laughs> and that's the most important thing, isn't it? You know, the fact that you've got your patients coming in who are getting better and, um, you know, that's what you're there to do, right? That's what you're mm. trained to do. You're, mm. You know, the word doctor means to educate, it's to, to, tr to teach and Correct. to help your patients, of course. Um, and, it's, and it's more important than that, Bobby, because the tools that we use in naturopathic medicine are intrinsically safe. Yeah. And the way that I explain that to my patients is when you use a drug for somebody, <clears throat> essentially they are blocking enzyme systems in the body. They're anti-inflammatory, they're antidepressants, they're anti-cholesterol or whatever. And so that increases the biochemical friction in the system. But by contrast, if we are using nutritional supplements, diets, hands-on techniques, herbal preparations or whatever, we are doing the opposite. We are reducing the friction in the system. We are allowing the body to heal itself. Mm -hmm. And that is what medicine should be all about. We should be healers uh, uh, to get the best possible outcome. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. And I think that will resonate with a lot of people. And obviously we're now at a time where so many people are turning to this approach because people aren't satisfied with those answers. And actually when I was um, doing some research myself into chronic fatigue syndrome previously, it was amazing how often the question would arise of, is chronic fatigue syndrome genuinely a condition? Is it a real thing? Is it psychosomatic? Is it, you know, and uh, it's such an awful thing as somebody going through these symptoms, experiencing these really, really distressing symptoms that's just completely changing their life to then be questioned by so many people as to whether they're making it up and whether it's all in their head. So, you know, this is where people like yourself and other practitioners in the field who do take that time to try and understand how they got there. And like you said, the mechanisms, it's crucial. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I do actually think that this is one of those conditions as well where you quite often hear people say, um, you know, it, it all started uh, from this point and I've never been right since. You know, I've never been right since. I always think that's an interesting one to hear. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you hear often when it comes oh. to chronic fatigue syndrome? It's absolutely essential. And um, uh, whenever I take a history from uh, a patient, I always ask the question, when was the last time you were fit and well and healthy? Because that gives us very good clues to causation. So, for example, if somebody says, well, I've never been well, you know, yeah. ever since a child I've been ill, then it's often allergy. And the commonest allergen in childhood is probably to dairy products. As you probably know, we're seeing epidemics at the moment of type 1 diabetes in children because we're having far too many dairy products. We know vaccines switch on autoimmunity um, uh, and vitamin D deficiency uh, is a risk factor for inflammation. So, yes, always ask the question, how did it start? What were the circumstances of that? Because that gives us a very good clue. Now, one of the most common forms of presentation is 
Simon says, well, I was never terribly well. And I had you know, tonsillitis and ear infections, which makes me, oh gosh, you know, dairy allergy again. And then I went to university and I got glandular fever, Epstein-Barr virus. <clears throat> now, I have to say, going to university is a very dangerous thing to do. Because when you go to university, um, it's stressful. The food is often awful because often these kids are... Uh, away from mum's good home cooking and they're <laughs> trying to go, do for themselves on a low budget so they're eating cheap with pasta and cheap carbohydrates their sleep is disturbed they're often staying up late at night they're stressed by the work that, that they're doing and so on and so forth uh, and uh, all those things predisposed to but the last straw is picking up that nasty little virus Epstein-Barr virus glandular fever and if they can't deal with that well that will flip them into an ME now, ME is, as we talked about, that's poor yeah. energy delivery mechanisms and inflammation. And if the body cannot get rid of or deal with that bar virus quickly and efficiently, it becomes chronic. Uh, and uh, this is about a fifth of the patients who come to see me with, with ME. That is their history. Mm -hmm. But it can be any virus. Uh, any virus, especially in stressful circumstances when we're least well able to deal with that virus. Or worse than that, we have to push on at work for some reason or other. Mm. Now, if anybody gets an acute infection, and it doesn't matter what that infection is, we should give the immune system the energy that it needs to deal with that. And that means we should rest up, keep warm, and do not symptom suppress with medication. Yeah. You might feel better in the short term with symptom suppression, but that stops the immune system fighting the virus. Yeah. If you've got an infection, we want to run a temperature. We want to feel ill so that we go to bed and wrap up warm and, and, and run an even better temperature. We want to cough because that physically expels it. We want to vomit, have diarrhea, be, sneeze because that physically expels the virus and reduces the loading dose. And all the symptoms suppressing medication that's out there on the market stop us having those essential symptoms that mm. allow us to deal adequately with that virus, whatever it may be. That's, that's well explained. I, I, I personally, I always ask, especially my younger patients, um, or if the parents are bringing them in, about their fevers and, you know, how high a fever do you run? Because generally, I mean, obviously there's a safety point here, but, you know, the, sometimes those higher fevers are actually shown to be beneficial. It's, it's a good sign of their vitality as a person. And like you said, when you suppress these things, what are the implications? And I guess then when you add on to it, somebody with a diet that's rich in refined sugars, What's that going to do to the immune system? Just suppress it even further. Well, it's worse than that because many of these microbes thrive on sugars and carbohydrates. Mm. And one of the things I hate to see is, is hospital patients surrounded by fruit, uh, grapes and melons because that's high in sugar and that feeds any infection that may, they may have. In fact, quick example of this, I remember I had a patient who came to see me a uh, young girl at university who had uh, huge um, boils and carbuncles in her armpit. She'd had all the antibiotics, intravenous, she'd had surgery, and uh, you know the, uh, the, in, the infection was literally invading her armpit. When I took a good history from her, she was a fruitaholic. She was living on fruit, uh, and she was just feeding that infection directly. So we stopped her fruit, uh, uh, gave her a ketogenic diet, some good nutritional supplements, topical iodine, I love iodine, contact kills all microbes, and within five months, with no antibiotics, she had completely healed. Wow. So it's a lovely illustration how sugars and carbs feed all infections. But we have to ask a question, it's not the fat itself that's the problem, it's how we get there. Yes. And uh, what lays down fat in the body is when we overeat sugars and carbohydrates, the blood sugar goes high, the body controls that by pouring out insulin, the hormone that brings blood sugar down, and it achieves that by shunting it into fat. Mm. So the fat is a symptom that we're eating too many carbohydrates. Yeah. And one of the nice things about doing a ketogenic diet and losing that carbohydrate addiction is you no longer feel hungry. You can happily go through the day, and if you don't eat, it doesn't matter. You yeah. don't run out of fuel. The brain continues to function. The body continues to function. Mike Wharton continues to run his 172 <laughs> miles running. without having to be fed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's not the fat that's the problem. Uh, and again, just to give you an example of how safe fat is, I like my patients to, uh, to, to eat fatty mm. meals and, 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 and oily food. It's easily digested. Now, normally, all other foods, 
have to go to the liver to be processed. Sugar, proteins, uh, the products of the fermenting all have to go to the liver to be processed. By contrast, fat is absorbed directly into the lymphatics and from the lymphatics directly into the bloodstream. Mm. They don't need to go to the liver because they're just not toxic. Yeah. They are there in the raw material that the body needs them and the body gets them to where they're needed as efficiently as it possibly can. And I guess this is a good point as well to highlight for, for our listeners what what the what the bad fats are that we that we really want to steer away from so what are your kind of absolute no no sarah in terms of the okay. fat world well the important thing here is that in nature there is no such thing as a bad fat in nature all fats are good now broadly speaking we have two types we have saturated fats. Now, saturated fats are short molecules, which are sat short carbon chains, which are saturated with hydrogen ions, and they are very tough molecules. And when you heat them, they retain their shape. So we should do all our cooking with saturated fats, things like butter, coconut oil, lard, um, uh, goose fat, beef fat, lard, uh, pork fat, whatever. The problem fats are the oils. Mm. Now, oils are oils because they're unsaturated. What that means is that they've lost the hydrogen and they are bent. They have a shape. Uh, so a saturated, um, an omega-3 oil, for example, would be bent, let's say, at the wrist. Mm. Omega-3 and 6 would be uh, uh, bent at the, uh, the wrist and the elbow and omega-9 at the shoulder, let's say. So they're all boomerang shaped. And in nature, they're all left-handed boomerangs. They're called cis oils, cis fats. But if you heat them or you make margarine from them and you hydrogenate them, some of them will get flipped into right-handed oils and they are called trans fats and they are the bad ones. That's what happens when you process foods, when you heat foods. And I think when people say, oh, well, we must avoid processed foods, what they really mean is we must avoid trans fats because mm. those fats have been heated or processed in some way because they don't fit biological enzyme systems. They clog up the works. It's like throwing a handful of sand into a finely tuned engine. It's a rotten idea. And it's the trans fats that are so dangerous. So what I would say is uh, any oils must be pr um, uh, pressed cold, kept cold and consumed cold, yeah. cook with saturated fats. That's the key. And I was pleased to hear that the fish and chip shop that won the best chips of the year, they cook their chips in beef lard. <laughs> very tasty and the perfect fat. <laughs> this is where you can become that very awkward customer in a restaurant asking the, you know, the waiter or waitress, uh, what, what oils are you using in there? I know this is always us when we go into a restaurant. I think we just tend to embarrass ourselves. That's very clear, Sarah, and thank you for explaining that because obviously we're talking about the importance and the benefits of eating a high fat diet, but at the same time, we need to make sure people are steering away from the bad fats and I mean when I see a, an average diet diary from my patients a lot of the time it's damaged fats it's trans fats coming through they're cooking with the wrong you know fats as you've just spoken about so that makes perfect sense so one thing we've kind of spoken about a little bit today is um, that link between the gut and chronic fatigue syndrome obviously you know Hippocrates the the, the founder of western medicine famously said that all disease begins in the gut. And I think a lot of the time that's that's very much true. Um, so in terms of the, that link there, are we talking about that that fermenting gut, that gut that's producing lots of bacteria, um, sorry, that, that gut with lots of excess bacteria in the wrong location, creating lots of gas? Is, is there anything else there that kind of connects Correct. the gut? Hugely, hugely. Now, say the upper gut needs to be sterile. As soon as you start fermenting in the upper gut, you will ferment to produce toxins. And the obvious one is if you've got yeast in the upper gut that ferments sugar, then that produces alcohol. It's called the auto brewery syndrome. <laughs> it's very common. And, uh, you know, if somebody and, and you can produce quite a lot of alcohol as a result of that. So if I was given a glass of wine for breakfast, guess what? I would not be able to function through the rest of the day. Yeah. But if you have yeast already in your gut there and you pour some fruit juice on top of it or you're eating um, uh, fruit at breakfast or a toast maybe with maybe marmalade or jam, then those carbohydrates will be rapidly fermented to produce alcohol. But with every microbe we 
could have in our upper gut, and there are many bacteria we could have, there are different products of fermentation. And those products include hydrogen sulfide. You know, that's the nasty gas that we grow in our, mm. that we, we learn about in at O-level chemistry. You know, the, 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 the stink bomb, which is a poisonous gas. We produce D-lactate, uh, uh, um, uh, other alcohols like pro propyl alcohol and butyl alcohol. Uh, so a whole range of, of toxic ferments. And then the microbes themselves, which live in the gut, they produce toxins. So bacteria in the gut will produce bacterial endotoxin. The example that we all know about is tetanus. <clears throat> tetanus doesn't kill us because we're infected by tetanus. Tetanus kills us because of the tetanus toxin that's produced. Mm. Uh, similarly with staphylococcus, if you have staphylococcus, Staphylococcus food poisoning. It's not the Staphylococcus that produces the food poisoning. It's the toxin that the, that's there. Yeah. And again, all fungi have their own mycotoxins, and they are poisonous to us. And they um, uh, uh, poisonous directly. They have to be dealt with by the liver. Yeah. So all these toxins pass um, via the portal vein into the liver, and in the liver they are dealt with. Now the business of dealing those with those toxins requires a huge amount of energy. So earlier we talked about the brain yeah. needing about 20% of the, all the energy the body uses. The heart requires about 7% of all the energy that the body generates and the liver up to 27% of all the body the energy generates. So as soon as you clean up your diet, as soon as you get rid of your upper fermenting gut, the liver doesn't have to work so hard. Yeah. And if the liver's not working so hard, then there's energy for the rest of the body to do things because the business of spending energy is called having fun and going to work, of course. <laughs> but we can't go to work, we can't have fun, uh, we can't use our brains, we can't go out and play football unless we have energy. Yeah. And if you're using that all up in the business of processing food, then you know, you'll become a, a, a couch potato, don't you? Of course. And I think these toxins that are circulating around the body if if we've got you know an overgrowth of bacteria that we don't really want in the gut that also can promote inflammation so it's kind of feeding into this vicious cycle where we're looking again at what what is the health of our gut looking like and i i often find in in case histories um i love getting to the gut section because even if you you know there's nothing obvious at that point by the time you get there as to is there something going wrong with the gut sometimes this is where all the answers uh, just are presented to you because suddenly somebody goes oh yeah actually i do bloat every meal but that's normal isn't it you, everybody bloats every meal right and i'm thinking no they really don't at all that's not normal it's common but it's not normal and these sort of symptoms start to unravel and then you think well you know if you if you do bloat a lot well that means a lot of gas where is that gas coming from bacteria and i think also with this this link with the gut i guess we can think about this idea of leaky gut and that barrier that lining of the gut being compromised so more opportunity for those toxins that live in that digestive tract in that tube to start spilling into the blood driving more inflammation damaging those mitochondria that you spoke about before and i think the point you made earlier on about mitochondria being linked to so many different illnesses it's sort of the same principle here isn't it we're coming back to these same concepts again and again and i'm sure if we applied your chronic fatigue syndrome protocol to a variety of diseases you would see great benefits probably even resolution in many of them better than that it's the starting point to treat all western pathology mm. It all starts with the gut. Uh, and you absolutely correctly point out the business about um, uh, toxins get into the bloodstream. But it's not just toxins. Bacteria and yeast can get into the bloodstream. Now, if these are friendly microbes from the large bowel that the immune system has been looking at for, for hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, it will understand that they are not pathogenic, they're not going to cause problems, and we simply excrete them via the kidneys. But if these are new microbes that the body is not used to looking at, then we risk uh, switching on the immune system. So these microbes get into the bloodstream, they circulate in the body, they cause inflammation in the bloodstream, and we know that's a risk factor for arterial and heart disease. But if they get stuck at distal sites, if they get stuck in the muscles, we call that fibromyalgia. If they get stuck in the joints, we call that arthritis. If they get stuck in the lungs, we call that intrinsic asthma and so on. I think there are a great many pathologies that are driven by allergy to microbes from the fermenting gut. 
It's called molecular mimicry because the idea here is the immune system, uh, when it fights any um, a microbe, the first thing it does, it makes antibodies. And if those antibodies then cross-react with self, they just happen to be the same shape as our own body organs, then they can start to attack our own body organs. And that's called autoimmunity. Yeah. And I have very little doubt, in fact, there's a huge amount of uh, medical research that shows that this is the case, that autoimmunity is driven by microbes from the upper fermenting gut. Yeah. So you can do yourself a huge favour by sorting out your diet and sorting out your gut. Yeah, agreed completely. Uh, well said. So if you've got um, a, a, a patient coming into your clinic with chronic fatigue syndrome or, or ME, are there any sorts of testing that you would do, you know, common types of testing that you find particularly helpful? Well, the first thing is many patients have had lots of tests done already and important clues within those tests have been missed. So, for example, um, the, and the reference ranges for normality have now changed. And the way that we establish those reference ranges <coughs> excuse me, is by looking at you know, 100 people that come into hospital, what are their results? Oh, that's the normal range. But yeah. guess what? 100 people coming into hospital are not normal. In fact, anybody who is eating a Western diet is no long, longer normal because they're not eating an evolutionary correct diet. And throughout my career as a doctor, the reference ranges have, a, have changed enormously. So, for example, when I was at medical school in the 1970s, one of the measures of inflammation in the blood is called an ESR. A normal result is considered to be <clears throat> an ESR of five or below. For some laboratories, that is now 30 millimeters per hour or below. It's set far too high. Similarly with the underactive thyroid. Now the thyroid is our accelerator pedal. It's the accelerator pedal that controls our mitochondrial engine. And the normal reference ranges for levels of thyroid hormone in the blood have dropped hugely just in my career. Uh, as at the time, the lab I tend to use reference range for a free T4, which is the active thyroid hormone in the blood, is about 12 to 22 uh, uh, picomoles per litre. Um, if but some laboratories, it's as low as 7 to 14. Yeah. So many cases of the underactive thyroid are going to be missed. So the first thing I say to my patients is, um, don't spend any money on tests. Give me all the tests you've already got and let's have a jolly good look at them and see what's going on. Now, of course, what you have to remember is that the patients that I'm seeing, you know, so often they're so fatigued that they're unable to work and they are very short of funds. And I would much rather they spent their money on good food, uh, sorting out the gut and good supplements before they do any tests at all. And this basic workup package I have for treating patients with chronic fatigue or ME doesn't require any tests at all. Uh, you just work your way through the regimes, yeah. which are detailed in the book. So, for example, um, I learned about mitochondria, as I said, in the 1970s. I realized in the 1990s that they had clinical application. And in the 2000s, I worked with the most brilliant biochemist in the world, Dr. John McLaren Howard, who developed a test for mitochondria. And what we showed with that mitochondrial, you know, let's test the engine test, yeah. is that uh, the, the more fatigued with my patients, the slower their engines were going and vice versa. And that was the, uh, we wrote up a paper about that was our first engine, our first paper. The next thing we had to ask was, why are those mitochondrial engines going slow? And uh, a very important reason for why they were going slow is because they don't have the raw materials to function. They've got the wrong fuel in the tank. Yeah. And how do we treat that? With diet. Now, we measured the common uh, deficiencies that we know impact on mitochondria, like magnesium, like coenzyme Q10, like vitamin B3. We know that if you're deficient in those things, then your mitochondrial engines will go slow. And uh, since those early days, I've now done 1,036 of those tests. And I now know what the regimes are uh, f to correct the mitochondria. Yeah. Now, at present, we don't have access to that test. Um, uh, the laboratory uh, is closed at the moment because John uh, is looking to retire. But it doesn't matter. We can still get patients well without having access to those tests because we know what works. Yeah. And that was the subject of my first book. My patients loved the title of it, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, 
it's mitochondria, not hypochondria. That went down very well with my patients. That was brilliant. And, <laughs> and again, it was the first objective evidence that this is not a psychological condition. Yeah. This is a pathological condition. The pathology is at is, is an atomic level. It's at a very, very tiny level. So we can't see it. We can't even see it with microscopes. You know, it's, it's the my, you know, mitochondria are tiny little cell organelles that are difficult to visualize, but just because they're difficult to visualize and look at doesn't mean we shouldn't be searching at them, doesn't yeah. mean we shouldn't be investigating them and looking at them. So mitochondrial function tests have been a fantastically useful tool. And that tells us that you know, this is not a psychological condition. This is pathological. That's fantastic. And I, I actually really want to come back to what you said about the reference ranges. That's such a key thing for people listening to understand in that those reference ranges like you said are based on the average patient does that mean that those are based on optimal levels for your health absolutely not so when we're you know in in clinic i think it's always good you know i always say to patients before when they book in bring any test results you've got because we may draw a different conclusion from those um the thyroid is a great example because as you've said the thyroid um and certainly in your protocol you put great significance on looking at the thyroid and, and addressing that if if necessary which is common uh, and i think also the tsh levels which is another parameter which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone uh, you may correct me on this sarah but i think conventionally the the normal range is is something like f less than four i believe if i'm not mistaken whereas mm -hmm. you know optimal ranges we're generally looking for more like less than 2.5 um so you know it, it's interesting somebody could come in with a uh, with a range that appears to be normal they're told it's normal but it's not normal um so important the, si the single most important aspect of testing the thyroid is to make absolutely sure that that patient is not thyroid toxic because the point here is that all diagnosis is hypothesis when somebody comes to see me i hypothesize that their diet is wrong that their mitochondria are going slow that the thyroid accelerator pedal is 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 running at 15 miles now instead of 60 miles now but blood tests are never definitive we then have to put that to the trial and uh, uh and so we put in place the uh treatments we need to correct the diet and gut function to correct our mitochondria to correct our thyroid uh, glands and if that patient improves as a result then we can say we've got the diagnosis right. Yeah. Yes, that was the mechanism. We've corrected with this. The patient is cured. Off they go. Yeah, makes sense. And I was also going to ask Sarah, do you do you use adrenal panels much? You look at adrenal gland function. Yes, and they are very useful tests. And uh, that's, uh, again, like the thyroid, I always test the thyroid before I would treat that. Yeah. And uh, almost invariably, but not always, uh, an adrenal s a test is very helpful. And the test I like to use uh, is a test that's done on saliva. Yeah. And the reason for that is um, patients can do it in their own home. If you bring patients into a clinic for a blood test, that is stressful and that skews the result of the test. So this test can be done at home very easily. Anybody can access it. And the second reason why it's useful is saliva gets around the problem of protein binding. So the tests are more accurate. They much, they're much more physiological. They reflect what the patient is doing at home and then we can start to uh, look at those and that gives us a very good idea if the adrenal gland is starting to fatigue. Now, many patients that I see have already gone to an endocrinologist and they've had maybe some tests of adrenal function, shorts and acne test or whatever, and they've been told nothing wrong with your adrenal gland. But endocrinologists are very black and white people. Either the gland works or it doesn't work. They never diagnose adrenal fatigue, but that is the most common issue that we are grappling with in patients with fatigue syndromes so to be prepared to diagnose adrenal fatigue and we can do that with a very simple salivary test that's a very useful clinical intervention and what do you mean by adrenal fatigue just for our listeners sarah what it means is that um, the adrenal gland is not uh, it's the gearbox of our car. It's got stuck in first gear or second gear. It can't gear up to third or fourth gear in order to perform. And the reason for that may well be that the adrenal gland works through the mitochondrial engine. And if the mitochondrial engine is not in a fit state to respond because it doesn't have the fuel in the tank or it doesn't have um, the, the raw materials it needs to work, then all the adrenal kick in the world won't do it. So... Uh, we, it, we have to look at these in the round. 
We yeah. never look at these things in isolation. And this is why we always have to start with getting the diet and the gut function sorted out so you've got the right fuel in the tank for our mitochondrial engines and we've got the right raw materials for our mitochondria to work. And then we can start to look at the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox because they are the control mechanisms. And if you don't get the, the mitochondria right first, then you're flogging a dead horse, as my father used to say. <laughs> well said, well said. I, I like that. So, I mean, with the adrenals then, um, we're really looking here at trying to get the gearbox in action so that we're going back to that idea of of how the body is using energy and i guess the thyroid like you said is that accelerator so we can step it up a notch or we can bring it back and actually um with the adrenal salivary test that you mentioned the one thing i quite like about them is that generally they will take four samples through the day because of course with any test if you were to do a blood test yeah you know, that is a snapshot in time and the next day or the next hour it could be something different so it's quite nice that you can also get a bit of a map through the day as to how is it looking Correct is there a time of the day where it's looking abnormal another part might look okay within the ranges so so yeah there's a, I, I personally quite like doing that in, in clinic too so Sarah we have spoken uh, sort of in and out about your protocol but what would be great now is to kind of draw this together for our listeners in terms of if somebody is suffering with chronic fatigue syndrome or, or ME, it's putting something practical together. And I guess, of course, this is going to change based on the root cause, how they got there, which of course will be different. As we said before, maybe it was one of those, I've never been right since. So that will, of course, change how you approach this. Um, but just as kind of a, a general here, I know your protocol is very clear. Mm -hmm. If we start from the basics then, so you said we need to fuel the tank. So you've spoken about the, the paleo ketogenic diet, We've spoken a little bit here about what, what the, the, the bad fats are and the good fats are. Uh, is there anything else, just before we move on from fueling the tank, is there anything else that you want to add in terms of things people should or shouldn't be eating? So having got the protocol in place, we then have to make sure that the person is doing it properly. And the most the easiest thing to get wrong is the paleo ketogenic diet. And what I love people to do is to do tests to make sure that they are in ketosis and therefore they're doing the diet properly because it's a little bit different for everybody. Men, generally speaking, can get away with more carbohydrates than women can. And if you're very fatigued, then again, uh, you get away with fewer carbohydrates. So I like all my patients to test to make sure they are in ketosis and it can be easily done with either a urine test or a breath test. So that is vital. But no, you summed it up beautifully. Get the diet and gut function right, mitochondrial engine, and then move on to the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. And do it in that order. Okay. Don't just snatch at the adrenal gearbox because, as I say, that works via the mitochondrial engine. And if the mitochondrial engine isn't right, then you're not going to get the result from the adrenal gearbox. So it's in order that doing it correctly is vitally important so when you say in order if if you you know would were, were seeing one of your own patients and you said right here's how we're going to fuel your tank here's your, your diet gut support etc would you then give them like a couple of months or something doing that phase or how does how does that work how do you do that you can get on with it very quickly um you can get keto adapted in one to two weeks as soon as your keto adapted, then you're greatly improved your upper gut function. So then you can start to tolerate, a uh, uh, big pardon, you can absorb the raw materials that you need for your mitochondria to work. It probably takes, you know, two or three months for the mitochondria to really get up to speed. But if we are going to use uh, thyroid support and adrenal support, that too takes three or four months to get up to speed. So you can do that in parallel. Right. And there's a certain momentum about getting well. And I like to keep that momentum going because the regimes are difficult. What determines the pace at which you can go is how sick the patient is. Because the very sick patients will get what I call DDD, diet detox and die off reactions and they can be very painful so this is where it's so helpful to have a good therapist who understands because the very sick ones you have to start low and go slow and bring these regimes in gradually and re warn your patients that there is potential for them to get worse but please see that as a good sign of course it's very difficult with the very sick patients who can't afford to get worse uh, and, uh, and 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 that's always difficult but that is the principle of getting well yeah. and the other thing I always say to my patient is there's only one person that can get you well and that's you yeah 
And my job is to give you the rules of the game and the tools of the trade so you can do it. Because nobody's going to be better motivated to get well than you. Nobody's going to be better empowered to get well than you. And yes, I can obviously help advise, but you've got to walk the walk. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point to highlight because ultimately that's the person living in that body. And, you know, you see them for what, an hour every so on, you know, month or whenever it is, and they have the rest of the time to, to get on and do it themselves. So it's a really good point to highlight. And is there anything else, Sarah, in terms of the, the diet that you ask your patients specifically to avoid? Are there any other no-nos? We've spoken about the, the sort of the damaged fats, mm -hmm. but anything else? It's the addictions. Okay. And believe you me, I'm a natural addict uh, and, uh, and I could happily get addicted to sugar. And the way that I do it is I say no to the first one. So the difficult situations are always going to be the social situations. When you go out for a meal, um, as you mentioned earlier, or go out for friend, with friends, and it's so tempting to, to have an addiction, um, but one addiction switches on another. Uh, so if you can be mindful of that, then that is the key thing. But otherwise, eat anything, salad things, all green vegetables, yeah. you know, nuts, seeds, berries, they're all good. Uh, probably fruit is, a, is, is always difficult. People think fruit is good, but the high fructose fruits, the, particularly the tropical fruits and apple fructose is actually more pernicious than the white stuff than the white sugar and the fruitaholics think they're eating well they think they're eating naturally uh, but they're not so fruit is always fruit is just as addictive as sugar and let's face it it is just a bag of sugar so any fruit make sure it's the berries black currants gooseberries uh, maybe strawberries raspberries uh, they're the safe fruits to go for yeah and not fruit juices <laughs> Oh, definitely, definitely not. not which... They're lethal, lethal, lethal. <laughs> Instant fermenting gut with fruit juices. It, I, I think I, I, I feel as though, you know, a lot of people look at it and go, it's fruit, you know, it's got high vitamin C labelled in there. This comes back to, of course, you know, the food industry and how food can be made to appear healthy. It's a bit like the whole kind of low fat labels on food, making it seem healthy and appealing. Whereas, of course, there is vitamin C in there, but a whole lot of sugar. So um, yes, definitely avoid those. So talking of the food industry, do you think that this is maybe in some way contributing to what we're seeing with chronic fatigue syndrome and, and other diseases? Well, if you are running a business and you want to sell a product, the best way to sell it is to get your clients addicted to it. And most processed food is addictive and we eat it in an addictive way. And even fruit, even the fruit growers themselves know that we're addicted to sugar and fructose and, uh, and the like. And uh, the modern varieties of fruit are getting sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. I mean, primitive woman's idea of an apple would have been a crab apple. And nobody's going to get addicted to those. They're pretty tart old things, but we've bred them to become sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Uh, and... Uh, of course, as soon as you start to process a food, then it loses its nutritional value and it loses its flavour and they end up stuffing it full of flavour enhancers, which are inherently bad news. It might be artificial sweeteners, it might be monosodium glutamate, uh, uh, but all these things are detrimental to our health. It's the old story. Yeah. Nature has all the answers and we should eat food in a mo the most natural state that we possibly can. And as soon as it gets processed, then there are going to be problems arise as a result. So uh, that is the simple take home uh, message, really. Avoid the processed foods uh, and eat as naturally as you possibly can. So really, it comes back to making sure that you're trying to avoid ingredients lists wherever possible. And that is correct. Ideally, is putting correct. them up from your garden if you can. And if not, trying to opt for good quality, ideally organic produce, um, you know, that's certainly what we yes. can uh, we can aim for. But I think it's important to, to highlight this because I, I do sometimes actually feel um, a little bit sorry for some of my patients who come in thinking that they're doing the right thing because they're just going along with what they're being told is good and healthy and, um, and at the root of it, it isn't. And obviously this is a really good example here. Um, so that's really helpful. Thanks for explaining that, Sarah. In terms of other foods, I was interested what your views were on gluten when it comes to chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, I attended a conference a few years ago and the consensus of that conference is that gluten is such a dangerous food, it should be fed to animals only. Uh, gluten, the gluten content of grains has got higher and higher and gluten is a very strong antigen. It's very good at switching on the immune system. It's pro-inflammatory. 
So we're seeing epidemics of inflammation at the moment. Uh, Yehuda Schoenfeld, consultant immunologist, reckons that one in 20 of the population are have an autoimmune condition. And that's when an autoimmune condition is like civil war in our bodies. It's the immune system fighting ourselves, uh, and that is invariably damaging and shortens lifespans. Yeah. So gluten is just not for human consumption, is my personal view. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think even looking broadly at it, you know, if we go into a supermarket, what we're seeing is not, you know, whole foods. We're not looking at whole wheat. We're looking at wheat that's been heavily processed and mixed in with sugar and other, you know, nasty ingredients. Um, and we're not looking at, at this as a, as a whole food anymore. So ultimately, as soon as you start stripping nutrients out of foods, mm -hmm. what you're mm -hmm. going to be left with is not very nutritious. Um, actually, actually, we shouldn't be calling it food. That yes. is a misnomer. We need to <laughs> redefine that term. I think that's a good one. <laughs> I like that. Chemicals. <laughs> um, okay, that's really useful. So we've, we've kind of gone through that first step of fueling the tank, and I think that's all very clear. So the next step after that, tell me a little bit about what the key principles are in terms of your kind of therapeutic approach. Well, uh, sort out the fermenting gut, of course. Of course, uh, yeah, I can't forget and that. And we do, we do that, we starve it out by not feeding those microbes, and then we kill those microbes with vitamin C and iodine. Now, both vitamin C and iodine contact kill all microbes uh, but we don't we mustn't take them together we take them apart because vitamin c works as an oxidizing agent and for the biochemists out there that's an electron donor and uh, a bit of an electron receiver and iodine is the other way around uh, it uh, uh, is an electron receiver so they knock each other out but we are all deficient in vitamin c and we are all deficient in iodine and they're what both are one of my favorite multitasking tools. We're all deficient in vitamin C because somewhere on our evolutionary pathway, we lost the ability to make our own vitamin C. So my little dog, Nancy, uh, she can make her own vitamin C and she can make up to 15 grams a day, according to demand. Wow. That's 15,000 milligrams. Ditto goats, ditto horses. It's only humans fruit bats and guinea pigs that cannot make their own vitamin C. So we should all be taking at least five grams of vitamin C. And I recommend taking that in the morning uh, without the first meal of the day. And then the second micronutrient that we are all deficient in is iodine. And again, I love iodine. It contact kills all microbes. Yes, it's essential for the thyroid, but it's also essential for our breast health, for our immune system, for our brains. Iodine deficiency is the commonest cause of mental retardation throughout the world. It's also necessary to make the love hormone, and that love hormone is called oxytocin. Now, for those that don't know what it is, it's what Titania put on Puck's nose so that he fell in love with Bottom. I beg your pardon, it's the other way around. It's what <laughs> Puck put on Titania's nose so that she fell in love with, uh, or rather, uh, Titania's eyes so that she fell in love with, with Bottom when she woke up. And we know that kids with autism are lack this hormone, and uh, that may well be because they're iodine deficient. Right. I'm going off as a tangent as I'm prone to. But so, iodine, last thing at light. And I like to use Lugol's iodine, 15%. Three drops in a glass of water, last thing at night, very much helps to clean up the upper fermenting gut and, and reduce that fermentation process. Excellent. I always love the fact that you can get iodine from sea mist. I think that's such an amazing thing. Whenever I heard that a number of years ago, I thought, wow, that's amazing. You literally have to be stood by the sea and the mist of the sea brings the iodine from the water so it makes sense why you know the rates of iodine deficiency are generally lower the closer you are well, to the sea I would, supposedly i would want i would want to look at the dose of iodine in that sea yeah mist. i'm not sure I, it's so high i think it, it, it might not quite be a therapeutic dose <laughs> 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 we'll roll with the little bit, but uh, yeah, maybe to top that up with some seaweed and, and goodness knows what else. Okay, that's great. So we're looking at iodine there to, to help with the gut and to help with the thyroid, of course, given that it's, you know, pr primary role in terms of where it goes to in the body is the thyroid. Um, in terms of um, supporting the thyroid, what's your kind of key, um, key approach that you would take, Sarah, if somebody maybe does have a sluggish thyroid gland? Well... We are seeing epidemics of autoimmunity, as I mentioned. 
Dr. Kenneth Blanchard, who's a consultant endocrinologist in America, reckons that 20% of Western population have an underactive thyroid. And in the chronic fatigue syndrome population, <clears throat> that percentage is going to be much higher. So we're do you're just not going to be able to correct the thyroid <clears throat> with a bit of RD, iodine or tyrosine or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. And most people with an iodine problem will need thyroid glandulars. It's called natural desiccated thyroid and it's available as a food supplement uh, that we can get from, uh, from many sources. And the key with natural desiccated thyroid is to start with very low doses and build up very slowly because it's easy to overdose. So with any thyroid problem, always do a blood test to make sure that uh, you don't overdose and build up slowly. And I, I finished writing a thyroid book that will come out in October where I go through the steps. Uh, but the natural desiccated thyroid, maybe you'd start off with 15 milligrams um, uh, daily for a week and then you build up to 30 milligrams and then to 45 milligrams. Depending on your body weight, most need between 90 and 120 milligrams to normalize and to feel well. Right. And so there are many sources of that. So that's actually a very easy thing to do and a very rewarding thing to do as well because patients get immediate benefits from that. And, and would you apply the same concept of using glandulars for, for adrenal function if it flags up that there seems to be an underactive Cor sort correct, of underfunctioning yes. gland? There's a whole range of... Uh, bovine glandulars uh, which we give in physiological doses now this is very different from the steroids that doctors use as an immunosuppressant to suppress disease and we know that they are uh, have many many side effects which are nasty uh, these glandulars as we think of it as food for the glands uh, to allow them to uh, 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 function more effectively but remember the most important thing about the adrenal gland is to ask the question why it is fatigued and the commonest cause of adrenal fatigue is, dare I say it, sugars and carbohydrates. Because if we're eating sugars and carbohydrates, the body responds to a high blood sugar by producing insulin. Insulin brings the blood sugar down, and that is stressful for that person. And they respond with the stress hormone, which is adrenaline. And adrenaline is then followed by a burst of cortisol uh, and then a burst of DHEA. So we see adrenaline appearing from second to second. Cortisol appearing from minute to minute and DHEA and other such adrenal hormones from hour to hour. And if we are constantly thrashing our adrenal glands with sugars and refined carbohydrates, with the stress of life, and some people run their whole, bo their whole lives on adrenaline and yeah. caffeine and they're kicking their adrenal glands all the time, should we be surprised that that, that adrenal gland gets uh, fatigued? And the answer is no. So yes, we have to address the underlying roots of that yeah. stress and say number one again is diet and then support the adrenal gland um, with with glandulars there are some herbs that are very useful too like ginseng and ashwagandha but you bobby know much more about that than i do <laughs> <laughs> they, they're fantastic and you know herbs if if the adrenals need a little bit of a kick herbs like licorice can be fantastic that's one of my go-tos ashwagandha of course is a beautiful beautiful ayurvedic herb so good for the adrenals so these can be these can be great i think it's really important that you're just highlighting really that it comes back to the individual so we've got the kind of the the principles the philosophy and we adapt it to suit the person and um obviously this is why you've had such great success sarah so that brings us to the end of the podcast. And I just wanted to say a huge thank you to you for sharing your knowledge. It's, it's very important that, you know, you have this sort of platform to put this information out there because there are a lot of people that will hopefully be really helped um, and feel some support actually um, and feel some encouragement from what you've said because they will hopefully get some kind of practical steps to improve their health. My final word will be there will be many people that will try to put... Um, patients off the track and, and sadly that includes many doctors who do not understand uh, where we're coming from and of course that's why I've been prosecuted so much <laughs> so listen to the argument work the logic out for yourself from first principles and then as I say just do it don't hang around for expensive tests just get on with things and uh, there's no reason why you can't kickstart the recovery process as in con as a result of that Thank you, Sarah. And I, I think those words should be the closing words because they were so <laughs> wisely said. So thank you so much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you soon. My pleasure. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Sarah.
Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss a future episode. If you have any ideas for future topics you'd like us to talk about, please let us know in the comments below.